It's the nightmare for anyone involved in shooting or hunting sports. Our nasty, hate-filled national media prints a photograph of you and tells its readers that you should be imprisoned or killed, or at least hated. That is what happened to Adrian Court last week when the Times newspaper ran a story about him going hunting in Africa. It was a bit of a shock to see your name in print and for you to be portrayed in such a way that you're coming across as the bad guy. It, it, it wasn't particularly nice to see the words written about you, especially as they were taken completely out of context and not entirely true. The questions that the Times asked me were not addressed in the article. So yes, it was, it, it, it was a shock. Adrian asked Field Sports Channel to help him with his response to the Times. We are the media experts after all. And if this is happening to you, there is some advice which I'm going to lay out in this film. The first depends on your reply to the question, do you want to talk to this newspaper or not? Adrian wanted to help the Times. We will come back to Adrian and how he did that. Another Field Sports Channel viewer who contacted us about the same article did not. Let's look at how the other viewer, Mr Unhelpful, kept his name out of the article. Mr Unhelpful has a job with a company that's big enough to have antis in its HR and PR departments. And it only takes one ante in a senior position to scare the board and panic the shareholders, which is the basis for most animal rights extremists' success with these stories. The weakness of animal rights extremists who sell their stories to newspapers is that their research is ropey at best and, most important for the newspapers, uninsured. We advised Mr Unhelpful to do two things. First, to point out to the Times that the extremists have got their facts wrong, which also has the advantage of being true. And second, to make it clear in advance that if the Times wished to use a photograph of Mr Unhelpful, it will cost £3,000 per image. A lot of money. For those two reasons, the Times didn't use Mr Unhelpful's story and didn't use his picture. Let's stop there and listen to Diggory Haydoke's story. Well, I was called by a Times journalist to, um, to give some information on the um, charity contributions and the, the local, um, uh, local conservation fees that were paid by um, every trophy hunting uh, hunter. You know, when you go along to uh, tr uh, a safari in Tanzania, part of your fee, it's normally about 20% on top of what you're paying for everything else, is, is it paid as a conservation fee, and that is directly used to um, help you know, fund anti-poaching patrols and contribute to you know, local uh, schemes which will uh, you know, disincentivize the locals to poach the animals and give them something else instead, make them value them. So this chap wanted to know, you know if this was widespread and how much it happened because they were do he was doing a story which turned out to be a story on uh, claiming there were loopholes uh, that were going to be exploited by the trophy hunting industry uh, to get around this mooted ban of trophy imports from countries where trophy hunting is legal and necessary and useful. I gave him the information and explained how it worked and that was as far as it went. Uh, lo and behold, a, a picture of me with a dead buffalo appeared in the Times the following day with trophy hunting loophole being exploited by hunters or something like that and a little bit of a hit piece on it. Not, not totally a hit piece, but a little bit skewed, and you know, the headline was certainly negative. Uh, so I had a look at this and thought, well, they've used my picture without uh, my permission, which has happened all the time. Ever since I started on TV with Piers Morgan, they just go and pinch my pictures for the mirror or for whichever newspapers are deciding to use them. I'd always assumed that because the pictures were things that they just got hold of, that they, they could use them. Um, but um, having spoken to you, I realised that this was perhaps a little bit dodgy. I got in touch with the picture editor at the Times um, and um, sent him a bill for £1,200. Uh, we quibbled a little bit and we, I, I agreed at the end of it you know, to, to draw a line underneath it that I'd accept £650. And, we, um, and I told him that obviously if he needed to uh, use my pictures or input again, I was very happy to provide it, but uh, it would be nice if he let me know in advance and we agreed a mutually acceptable fee before I had to 
to come and chase him after the fact. So it, it, it ended reasonably. The important thing there is the difference between use and copyright. If you ring up a newspaper and complain about them using a picture, they will tell you that it's in the public domain. What you need to do is complain about the copyright and ask for a reproduction fee. For professionals such as country sports photographer Sam Farlap, it's how they make a lot of their money. The fair use thing, I mean, you might get away with it if you're a, a small educational facility, a school, um, and it was floating around on the internet. But no, anything that's commercial, which a newspaper is, not a hope in hell. Have you um, had success in spotting them using your pictures and successfully claiming cash off them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's become an actual, I mean, I think for most professional photographers, it's actually become a part of the income now is, is tracking down and, and, and billing infringes, for sure. What, what's, what does it involve? Yeah, I mean, the hunting ones are wonderful because quite legally, we sell them to the Telegraph quite a lot. They, they, they're quite a good client. Um, and from their website, the aunties just love stealing them. Well, we've had all sorts. We've had an MP, uh, a Tory MP, and it's right, sorry, a Labour MP, using it um, against fox hunting on his own personal website. That was, um, and then he had the cheek to actually ask me to prove I took the photo before he paid up. That was quite an interesting one. Um, there is a really big animal activist um, group who used one last year for all their social media they took it from the telegraph again all their social media all their facebook that just started appearing on facebook a little while ago um so we just got loads of screenshots and we've got a, um, an agent who deals with most of that stuff and they sent them the standard letter and eventually they did pay up they realized they had to pay up but that was a really good one because i actually got my agent to write to them and tell them that all the money that they were paying up was being donated to the hunt in the photograph <laughs> there was a real um there was a real uh, uh, sort of karma in that one <laughs> that's really good um, <laughs> where their money was going <laughs> so is there is there a um i mean let's, let's deal with the agent thing first of all so is it worth if you've got one photograph that's been ripped off, it's not worth getting an agent for that, is it? It depends if you want to be bothered with writing the legal letters, um, because technically you have to write and inform them that they, they're they using it, obviously they know they're using it, um, and ask to see a copy of the license to use it, which obviously they don't have, but they then have to say, oh, we don't have a license. Then you have to negotiate the license cost. It's easier if you've got an agent doing all that for you. Yes, you have to pay a cut to them, but... To be honest, it takes so much hassle out of it. Um, I mean, people so, do it in different ways. That's the way I found. I've got 90, 90 odd cases just this year going through, um, and that's 18 of them will go to court. So I haven't got time to be dealing with that, basically. <laughs> Most of them are actually overseas. So um, they, they're dealt with by the agent just has um, a sort of a lawyer in every country basically and they just deal with them there the agent um, sounds amazing can you can you tell me the name of the agent there's two that we work with one is called pixie p-i-x-s-y um the other one is called copy track there are links to the two picture agencies sam mentions in the description below or there is nothing to stop you issuing your own invoice best if you have contacted the offending news outlet in advance here's an update on diggory's story I, i've been bugging the um the mail online, because they've got a photo of me which was taken in Tanzania on my camera, which they've lifted off one of my Facebook sites or, or websites and yep. stuck on their on their mail online. And I think it was in the mail as well. It's had like yep. 36,000 um, know, um, shares. So they've done well yep. out of it. Good. Yeah. Um, I've sent them a bill for it and they've said that they, they want me to prove it's my copyright. How the hell do I do that? So did somebody take it of you? Yeah, on my camera. So I've got the original camera roll with all the yeah. all that sequence of, of stuff on it from that entire holiday. So technically, uh, the person who took the photograph owns the copyright. Yeah, I've, I wrote back to them and said, you know, the photographs were taken on my film by a friend or an employee and therefore remain the, um, the, the copyright of the company. And I've asserted that on my website, which is the only place you could have got it from. If you think yeah. differently, tell me where you did get it from and who you paid. Yeah, I mean, there are two things. Firstly, it's not up to you to, to 
uh, prove to them, I think, given that, you know, it, it is clearly your picture. Secondly, um, if you get in touch with the outfitter and just get them to drop you an email saying, we confirm we took a photograph of you, then, uh, you know, you're, you're laughing. Now, Diggory is helpful to newspapers, and you can be, because as a hunter, you have done nothing wrong. That's what Adrian felt, and he got back to the Times. So I was approached by Dominic Kennedy from the Times, an investigative journalist. He informed me that my name was going to be mentioned in a forthcoming book by an anti-hunter. He provided me with some bits and pieces to comment upon. I did so. I answered his questions honestly. I gave him the information he needed, plus more besides, and we exchanged five, six emails each time I gave him what he wanted. You were helpful. I mean, the, you know, you could have been unhelpful. You could have just... Yeah, I could have done. I could have completely ignored it. But at the end of the day, I wanted my opportunity to put my point of view across, to dispel some of the lies that were being quoted by Kennedy in the Times. And I thought it was a perfect opportunity to speak up for, not only for myself, but for other people as well that were in the same position as me. He asked me to comment upon the fact that hunters do not take easy headshots for fear of damaging the aspect of the trophy, but instead prefer to go for the more difficult heart, lungs and shoulder target area, which is complete. I, well, I, I couldn't believe it, to be fair. It, it, it took me a couple of minutes to understand what, what he was trying to find out but apparently this is the the um, motive that Goncalves is, is going with in his book that hunters don't take easy headshots and go for the more difficult chest area shots completely wrong he also asked me if hunters deliberately shoot from distance to keep themselves safe from the animals again that's that's Absurd. Like the, the, you, you can't even begin to describe it. it it's just it's ridiculous. You do not shoot animals from distance to keep yourself safe. Crazy. He didn't run those particular aspects in the articles. So, I mean, it seems... No, because it goes against the narrative that he's trying to give out in the newspaper. It, it goes against the information that's being written in the book. I'd rather run an article that was had facts in it rather than downright lies. And just give me some examples of where he mucks it up in the article itself but he completely ignored everything that that i told him and i'm sure other people told him as well he went with the he ran with the, the emotive side of it he, he described situations that were taken completely out of context for example goncalves in his book has written about me hunting zebra the, the excerpt from the book that he gave me it was just a, a diatribe that spanned five years and it was completely out of chronological order. It, 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 was, it just made confusing reading and he, he, he didn't have any idea what he was talking about. It is hate speech because he is, he is promoting the stories that he's promoting and naming the people in, the, in his book and in the article in the newspapers, knowing full well that they're gonna be in the firing line, excuse the pun, of the anti-hunters. So yeah, it, it is a form of hate speech, absolutely. I mean, he's, he went to some lengths to identify you, to where you live, what your job is. Are you now worried? I'm concerned that somebody would do that, put my name, job, where I live, in the press, yes. I'm not worried about comments on social media, in the, on the Times page, it, because 99% of the time, it's from people that haven't got a clue what they're talking about. They're just running with the story, thinking, oh, he's a hunter, he's bad. Let's just make a comment along those lines. I, I, I just hope that at some point, hunters are portrayed a little bit more favourably as conservationists. It's not all about sitting on the back of a truck, driving around Africa, shooting everything you see, leaving it wounded, whatever else the aunties like to think. It's not like that. I rang the journalist Dominic Kennedy too. Of course he has his headline already in mind and when it comes to hunting stories you can bet that that headline is going to be, if we were a religion or a gender, hate speech. 
In the end, Dominic made several factual errors supplied by the antis, such as assuming that it's unusual for animals to run after they've been shot. He's been watching too many war films. Anybody who goes hunting knows you always want your animal to drop on the spot. And most of the time they do. However, there are occasions, due to circumstances, that the animal, although it is dead, it will run. Nerves, adrenaline, it will run and then it will collapse 100 metres away. It doesn't mean the animal is still alive. It doesn't mean the animal can feel pain. It just means the animal has run at the reaction to the shot and the psychological or physical state its body is in at the time. And he didn't make any of that clear? He no, just... no, no, no. No, he, he, he completely ignored the fact that hunters can and do kill animals with one shot and they drop on the spot. And he's completely gone with the story that animals get shot and then they run and then they get left or die in pain or in agony. And that's completely wrong. And that it's bad practice to try to dispatch wounded game. Of course it's the hunter's responsibility to shoot wounded game. It's, <laughs> that's, that's absurd. To, to even suggest otherwise is, is crazy. Dominic only used a couple of lines at the bottom from Adrian, staunchly defending hunting. I say all credit to Adrian for trying. How do we change the story in the long term? There is one surefire way to get a newspaper on your side, and that's to buy advertising from them. The animal rights advertisers in The Guardian mean that paper is never going to run a positive story about hunting. I did help edit The Guardian's fly fishing supplement 20 years ago, but I reckon that is the first and last time they do that. I applaud Basque's adverts in the Yorkshire Post. It's a good quality regional newspaper which now gives grouse shooting even coverage. In the short term, I say, if you can, be like Adrian. Tell your story with dignity and accuracy. With the media in the state it's in, it's all we can do. And if they cut up rough, why not make some money on the side, like Diggory?